Good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you very much for a very excellent uh, teaching and uh, learning conference day. We've had a fantastic day, um, some superb sessions all the way through. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved, organisation, chairing sessions, giving sessions, posters, providing the lunch, everybody. It's been a really good day. And to finish, um, an absolute pleasure to have an inaugural lecture as a keynote at the end, um, because uh, the inaugural lectures are very, slight, slightly weird, but very fine traditions in universities where um, our inaugural lecturer uh, ends up with probably the strangest uh, lecture audience of his or her life um, when you have a mixture of parents and friends and old colleagues and new colleagues and people from around the university and anybody who just came in to get out of the rain, you know, from outside the rail building. So <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all to Neil Witt's inaugural lecture over the technology enhanced learning horizon, Desert Islands, Dragons, Brave New Worlds. It's fantastic to be able to um, see uh, Neil in this position with us um, and to welcome particularly his parents, Tony and Neil. Congratulations. Tony and uh, Liz. Sorry, Tony and Liz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who's buying the first round of drinks tonight for me? <laughs> okay, let's see if I can do slightly better on this. I'd like to welcome Tony and Liz. <laughs> Um, who've uh, come, come to join us. Uh, that's, it's really a great pleasure to have, to have you with us this evening. And uh, various colleagues from, from the past who've turned up. Um, uh, Ian Tunbridge, particularly, um, it's very nice to see you here. Uh, Mark Stiles, who's come down from Staffordshire. And Brian and Sue Chalkley have come all the way from, from Salt Ash. It's always a very great pleasure. <laughs> and uh, there were some messages from some old friends and people who knew uh, Neil when he was younger. Um, uh, to, to uh, also welcome him, uh, to, to um, uh, congratulate him on his chair and to, um, and to say they're really sorry that they couldn't come. This is our second of what are three inaugural lectures. Last year we awarded um, three professorships uh, to, uh, by the Teaching and Learning Route, which is brilliant in the university. They were the um, first three and uh, well deserved. We had Debbie's uh, inaugural lecture at the Pedro conference earlier in the year. Uh, Neil's coming now, and Troy will give his inaugural lecture in a teaching and learning um, day conference around internationalization on the 18th of December. And I'd hope to see many of you uh, back at that. But there's some messages coming from people who remember uh, Neil when he was slightly younger. <laughs> oh, <George>. <laughs> 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 um, uh, both Bill Rammel, who some of you will remember as the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and now Vice-Chancellor at uh, Bedfordshire, sends his apologies um, and he's very sorry he couldn't come, um, but he um, enjoyed working with you enormously and sends you all best wishes and congratulations. And Les Ebden, who uh, was uh, here for a long time and then also went off to Bedfordshire uh, and now heads up the Office of the, uh, the, the the, um, what does he head up? What's Les doing these days? Yeah. That one. Okay. <laughs> he says he's very sorry he couldn't come down to Plymouth today and he sends you very best wishes. And more worryingly, there were many messages from Laurie Phipps. Yeah. Most of which have had to be suppressed for the uh, purposes of um, delicacy, decency. And but he would also like to say, I've worked with Neil for many years and value the work that we did together and some of the fantastic things that you did uh, with uh, your team, especially around IPR, especially about uh, OERs, about accessibility. The stuff around accessibility was absolutely groundbreaking and extremely influential, influential nationally and, and internationally. Um, it is, in fact, the case that you did slightly grow up at some stage. <laughs> um, Laurie, Laurie was, was wanting to tell me a story about the day in which he pretty much managed to get a one gigabyte image to crash all your server systems. Yeah. Hmm. Do we know what was on this one gigabyte image in the days when one gigabyte would actually destroy the entire university's computing system? Was it our oh, cobblers then? Coloring in map, or something. <laughs> map coloring in. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And something about you creating a logo, the, taking the university logo and making a dolphin jump through it. Very possible. 
but apparently we can't show that anymore. No. <laughs> no. So veils should be drawn over these contributions to the university broader experience. Yeah, I'm glad the dolphin no longer exists. <laughs> We've got a lot of trouble. Did it? Yeah. Okay, good. So we won't mention the dolphin then, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's really important to know that uh, Neil is somebody who is the ultimate role model for winding participation students um, in higher education. So somebody who enjoyed his school career and uh, graduated with a number of O-levels, which notably included woodwork. And I was told I had to mention the woodwork O-level. Yep, Congratulations. That's all you need in life. That's all you need in life. And as a consequence, from a woodwork O-level to a chair in under 30 years, it's a hugely good academic achievement. <laughs> and very enviable and hard to do. And... Yesterday, he was awarded his National Teaching Fellowship as well, which is extremely good. Um, so as many of you will know, um, Neil is essentially a boat builder uh, and probably a, the only person in the room with a, uh, with a, a diploma in boat technology. Yeah. Boat technology? Fantastic. Woodwork, useful, you, woodwork <laughs> boat technology, just what you need. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> So then that led on to your degree in marine technology. It's something called the Polytechnic of the Southwest. That was Plymouth Poly when I arrived, it, and it changed <coughs> Poly Southwest to Virginia. So Neil is almost the only person in the university who can cite all the different names of the university through that late 80s and into the 90s and on because he's been here ever since. You know? And so having done your marine technology degree, you then went on to do a PhD in artificial intelligence techniques as applied to automatic ship guidance which was pretty groundbreaking at the time, since at that stage we barely had computers to, to work with. So, yeah, pretty good. And indeed, uh, surviving the Fastnet race one time, so I understand. Three times. Yeah. Three times? Three times around the Fastnet, that's pretty good. Though, um, your perseverance and style, which I think a lot of us do appreciate, is well demonstrated by the occasion when your head became wedged between two boats. I mean, normally people have sort of you know, car tyres and things to do this, Neil. <laughs> so if you've ever wondered why his head is quite that shape, something to do with two boats colliding, having your head in the middle. Swept off to hospital, very good, Derriford, fine, dealt with this. Many stitches later, as I understand it, you reappeared in the pub about 7.30. Yeah. And we're putting down the pints for anaesthetic reasons, and as described to me, the beer was just coming out through the holes where the stitches yeah. had been put in place. <laughs> yeah, fantastic, okay. <laughs> so anaesthetic, survival, straight back in there. So these days, uh, you may well find him in uh, slightly smaller boats than the J-classes and going around the fast net. And uh, for those of you who uh, also see him uh, in various other places um, with his paddleboard, um, a huge amount of work done with JISC, huge amount of work done um, in terms of research in technology and technology-enhanced learning, big international profile as befits uh, professors of the university, lots and lots of national recognition uh, for your practical and um, applied um, internet solutions for all sorts of things, work with web to rights too, and as a director of ICO3, which is one of the university's spin-out companies, all sorts of things going on. All your current work with the Horizon Group in the States and the new media consortium, which actually works to um, inform people about how emerging technologies will impact on higher education and what that actually means. And just for fun, when you haven't got anything else better to do, as some of you in the room will know because he'll have, he'll have uh, pursued you for money, a man who owns at least three Land Rovers and possibly more. They've all got nice names. This is, uh, this is Mr. Toad. There's one called Mr. Badger and there's another one called the Big Disco. And as some of us know, you've raised... Um, well over two and a half thousand pounds in the last couple of years for Macmillan, just by driving the Land Rovers around. It's great fun. You know when he's on campus or not, the Land Rovers are here. You can, you can find out where Neil is. But where Neil is most valuable to the university is in his real engagement with our students, with technology that's appropriate and designed for students and works for students. And one of the most useful things, and the thing that it took me a while to understand about Neil, is he won't let any software out into the system without it having been tested and retested with groups of students so that it works. In between times, he's um, running jolly projects. They tend to have jolly names that relate to um, the plant kingdom, the seed pod project, the pineapple project, the sea change project, the shellfish project. If it's got a really jolly acronym, it's probably one of Neil's projects. I could go on. We could spend a lot of time. I really do like this picture, and I can't tell you how many people really do like this picture. <laughs> and I can't imagine where I got it from. But I, was, uh, I can. I, <laughs> 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 but 
Well, it is indeed an enormous pleasure to invite Neil to give us his inaugural lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, that's all right. I'm going to come out here. My parents are around at all? Yeah, it's all right. Every lecture I give is like this. Yeah, it's, it's always full, so it's no problem today. Am I the only one who got the message about this being bring your parents to work day? Okay. Yeah, this, this inaugural thing, it's really, um, it's really difficult, going, oh, what can I do? And it's like, yeah, we just do stuff. And <clears throat> it's like, <clears throat> I don't do anything. I, I do things with loads of people, and I'm really pleased that lots of people are here that I work with and have worked in the past. So um, <clears throat> this is about the stuff, really, that, that we've done. So some of you, you've seen it before because you're involved in it. Some of you, it's pretty new. Um, but, you know, hopefully it all makes sense. If it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because in about an hour's time there's lots of wine being served. <laughs> okay. So I thought, well, what is this inaugural thing? Um, <clears throat> I thought, well, this is new to me. Um, hadn't been to any. Had a look round, thought, well, what would I do if I was, you know, what do my students do? Okay. Where do students go for information? I pose that question to you guys. Where do our students go? Google. 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 Yeah? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. It's nothing on Wikipedia. I tried, all right? <laughs> uh, I thought, go to Wikipedia, inaugural lecture. Oh, it's like nothing. Do you want to create a page about this? And I thought, yeah. <laughs> I'll do that later. Um, <clears throat> YouTube. YouTube is, uh, is, a, is a really good resource. Uh, it actually helps if you spell inaugural right. Um, <clears throat> I only noticed this yesterday, where it, luck, luckily the power of YouTube says, yeah, 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 it's fine. What you mean is that. So I was, I was having a really good look around YouTube, and uh, as, a, as a researcher, I did, did my homework. Um, I looked at 100 YouTube videos. It's really, really good, and I learned lots and lots about how to do a professorial inaugural lecture. I also learned how not to do it as well. Um, but apparently what you're not supposed to do is swear. Um, I can't do that because my mum's in the audience. And <clears throat> I'm not allowed to make any jokes about senior management. So it's going to be really short today. Um, <clears throat> okay. um, so one thing I did work out was that um, the average time for an inaugural lecture is 54 minutes and 24 seconds. So that's the challenge. <laughs> And since Pauline has eaten into my time, all right, I'll try and go a little bit quicker than that. So there we go. Um, <coughs> I have a maritime background, and uh, um, one of the things I thought, oh, we'll, 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 we'll go on a voyage today, a voyage of discovery. Um, not going on a journey, because a voyage, you, you, you're going towards a destination. And this is a, a sort of personal voyage, um, and I've included this wonderful quote from Peter Cook. Um, I've learned from my mistakes, and I'm sure I can repeat them exactly, because I like that. Um, it's about the only clean quote from Peter C Cook that I could actually put in here. Um, <coughs> uh, great fun going, Peter Cook quotes, Derek and Clive. No, can't use any of those at all. Um, so <coughs> we're going to go on a voyage over the next 40 minutes, and uh, hopefully we will arrive at our destination, which is the, the new tell world. And uh, hopefully we might learn something as we go through that. Um, of course, though, <coughs> I'm not going to make it that easy. Um, being an academic means that we're probably not going to take the direct route there. Um, so there's a few places that we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start off in the Dark Ages. We're then going to meander slowly to what I'm calling the Isle of Accidental Internet Adventures. <laughs> and once we've seen those, um, we're going to introduce, or be introduced to, and we're going to take on some dragons. And once we've seen the dragons, we're going to continue to a very nice place, which is the Isle, Isle of Shiny Happy People. <laughs> and of course, you can't have shiny happy people without some shiny, shiny things as well. All right, technology's in the title, so I'll be talking about some technology. Uh, Pauline's alluded to projects. 
And I'm sorry that, obviously, to the geographers in the room, that that's not a, a good representation of an atoll, all right? Um, but hey, get over it. Um, um, and we're going to go and have a look at the, the, the acronym uh, atoll. Uh, very, very quick look into the land of control freaks. And after we've been there, that we'll, we'll take quite an interesting path, I hope, and end up in the new world. So that's the plan today. Go and have a look over the horizon. Should be exciting. Now, dark ages. Um, <clears throat> Paulie mentioned I had quite an interesting <laughs> little background. Does anybody recognise this at all? Yes. It's an X Spectrum. <clears throat> ah, I'm quite excited because I've still got one. <laughs> it's here. <clears throat> as a kid, I shouldn't say this because my parents are here, but as a kid we used to go to WH Smiths. Remember WH Smiths? Yeah, when they, they used to sell loads. I know, but they just sell magazines and stuff. They used to sell computers. And you could go in there and <coughs> play with the computers. They were great. They were on screens and stuff. And if you started playing with, like, the peak and the poke buttons and putting random numbers in, you could get them to generate lots and lots of different colours and patterns. Uh, unfortunately, it would blow the graphics chip. So you had to run away from WH Smith really, really quickly. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I still have mine. It's got a blown graphics chip. Um, <laughs> so... After the Spectrum, I ended up with one of these. I'm sure my father can remember it because it cost him an absolute fortune. Um, it's a Ca Casio FX720, which is one of the most powerful programming scientific calculators ever made, or at the time, in 82 or something like that. We bought the additional storage. 2K <laughs> storage. It has its own battery, yeah? <laughs> Yeah. So this is the sort of stuff that, as uh, Paulie mentioned, I was at Falmouth Marine School many years ago doing sort of boat technology and engineering. And uh, I wrote software to do sail design on, on this. So yeah, it, was, it was there. It was quite good fun. <coughs> Must remember these. BBCs, absolutely brilliant. Staple of, uh, of every college and school in the 80s. Had great fun with the BBC. Is Adrian Hollister in the audience? I was thinking that someone from IBM, ex IBM, might not quite know this. This is my first ever proper computer. It's an IBM PS2. <coughs> Note the wonderful floppy drive on there. Mine was the posh one. It had two floppy drives. Um, but as a student, <coughs> that's the computer I actually bought. And it got me into um, <coughs> sort of real computing. Um, as actually, because John, Chud John Chudley in the audience somewhere? Yeah. yeah? <coughs> Hello, John. You used to teach me. <laughs> yeah, in the days when we actually did Fortran programming. Yeah. <clears throat> so I actually learned how to program in Fortran because someone had thought it was a good idea in a syllabus <laughs> to develop mathematical models in Fortran. You blame Thomas yeah, I blame you because <laughs> you're here. <laughs> um, <coughs> but, <coughs> yeah. My experience is you know, with a whole, whole range of technologies. I don't really want to dwell on that too much, but Paul mentioned my, my research, and I suppose really my sort of journey with all this internet stuff really starts on, on the back of my PhD. Uh, my PhD was great. I basically spent an entire summer driving a model boat around a lake. Um, <clears throat> it was a bit more than that. There was a, a 4 x computer and a load of gubbins and stuff like that, but it was actually really, really good. And I got my PhD, and um, <clears throat> I was taken on to do some postdoc work. And there's two, two projects. One of them is actually finishing off this work, which is part of a bigger national project on integrated bridge and ship safety. And the other one was a new piece of work looking at the, uh, the impact of um, <coughs> new technology on the training requirements of hydrographic surveyors. And it was really through that piece of work that um, <coughs> I came across you know, the internet by accident. You know, I didn't discover it. It was just there. And uh, we just tripped across it one day. And it was, hopefully it's quite an interesting story. Um, does anybody under the age of 30 know what one of those is? <coughs> it's a fax machine. I started this project <coughs> many years ago. I had to contact a whole load of companies. We were working with companies, trying to get information from them, communicating with them. And the only way to actually communicate with them was by a fax machine. <coughs> we didn't have enough money for a fax machine. So, need to send faxes, can't afford a fax machine. We got the next best thing, which is one of these. Fax modem. A few people nodding, remember the fax modems? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 14,400 bits per second. Yeah. 
<coughs> now, when he bought that for the fax machine side of it, I want to send faxes. And um, <coughs> with this fax modem came some disks, some software. And <coughs> we suddenly found out that we could access things called bulletin boards and FTP and using Gopher, and we could search for things. And <coughs> because we we're using a regular telephone line, I used to have to come in at weekends because it was actually cheaper for the university. So I used to come in at weekends. And <coughs> one day we discovered the web, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, Tim Berners Lee released the web, and there was a web browser, and we were bimbling around, and there was all sorts of stuff out there. And it was quite exciting. And I used to show this to people, going, look, these websites, this is the future, guys. And they went, no. Nah. It's really good, look, 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 click on that and it gives you more information. Click on it, it gets more information. Uh, no, I can't really see the point of it. And one day I was giving a demonstration to someone and I realised that the fax modem was switched off and I was still online. That's uh, really spooky. Hang on, I'm online. Machine switched off, what's happened? Well, <coughs> the university had an internal network and the computer I was using was on this network and the university was hosting uh, a, a Janet conference and the only one problem, the university was hosting a Janet conference, but it wasn't actually attached to Janet. So for that conference, they plumbed in the cables and we were on Janet. And somehow, internal networks, Janet, internet access was great. And within, I suppose, 24 hours, myself and a guy that I shared an office with, a guy called Craig Douglas, who's now part of TIS, uh, we, we shared an office because we were both smokers and we were like put in the office, you know, just go, just go sit there and just do that. You could smoke in your offices in those days. And we gone, this is quite good. So I had my desktop machine, and we downloaded a bit of software to set up a web server. And we set up our first web server, which was sort of one page. And when Craig sort of logged on, the server crashed. And thought, OK. But it was good. And uh, I, luckily, I had um, a, uh, this guy who was the head of a department, a guy called Tony Redfern, who was quite visionary. And I went to see Tony and said, OK, <clears throat> there's this thing coming. It's called the web. It's going to be really, really good. There's all sorts of things we could do with it. I want some money. He said, what do you want for? And I said, I want to buy a copy of an operating system called Windows NT, and I want to buy as much RAM as I can stuff into my computer. And he said, yeah, no worries. There you go. And um, <coughs> that was how it all started, that we set up our first web server um, based purely by accident. And <coughs> we uh, got a hold of the, the first version of, uh, of Netscape's own um, <coughs> communication server, version 1.1, which I still actually have somewhere. And they were so keen to get rid of it, they used to send you free T-shirts as well, which was really good in those days. Um, but that, that taught me a very, very early lesson about sort of technology. And it's not really about having the best and the fastest. It's about what you do with it. So the technology isn't the main driver. It's actually what you want to do with it. Now, you'll see some of these points coming up. And because my memory is getting absolutely awful and I forget things, um, I'm just going to transfer them to these slides as they come up. So you'll see these sort of so what points sort of appear throughout the presentation, and I'll, I'll talk about them in more detail at the end. I'm just going to park them as they, as they come up. So, where were we? Oh, yeah. My first website, my first web server. Ran for about 18 months, this one. Um, <coughs> this hasn't quite got the dolphin with the university logo in it, but you, you can see at the time I was working with the, for the Institute of Marine Studies that had its own logo, which was a dolphin, and the university logo was like this, ball type thing. And it doesn't take too much to realise that if you turn the dolphin around and you spin the ball, <laughs> you can make your own logo. And, um, <clears throat> and this was also at the same time when the university's DNS server used to be someone's own desktop machine. And when that machine crashed, we found out we could actually take over the, U the university's DNS, which means that we could take over and become the university's website. So occasionally this random website would appear with a university dolphin spinning ball thing. <laughs> and I got shouted at for that. <laughs> <laughs> Lots. <laughs> it's an amazing piece of time. I mean, this is, this is, this is superb. People just come, you know, marvel at this webpage. And if you can see the, the, the wonderful tiled background uh, and the fact that we nearly managed to centre all the text. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. and, and the neon green highlighting, all right? And you can't see it very well. There's drop shadow here, all right? <coughs> that was state of the art. We did realise that's probably not the best thing to do, so we tied it up a bit, cleaned it up a bit. And it, it, the website ran for a whole number of years, very, very popular, lots of hits, got everywhere. 
Um, but I want to point out some of the stuff we were doing with it, which is the more important side of it. Um, you'll notice there there's this link, navigation issues, questionnaires. One of the things that we did right in the early stages is actually think about, okay, um, we've got stuff out there giving people information. Can we gather information? So, uh, and I always had uh, undergraduate students, they're always collecting information. And it was like, look, you're dealing in, I was teaching marine communications, we're dealing communications, why don't we try this? So we're putting these questionnaires out with the students and they were promoting them online. I was doing the same, really, really popular. We were one of the first you know, institutions to actually put our <coughs> research stuff online, working with the students, get them to promote it, get the data in. We're getting lots of people from industry coming in, giving us their opinions, really, really useful. <coughs> this link probably doesn't mean me much, marine related sites. Well, actually behind that was a, a set of 3,000 links because um, this was in days before Google and before Wikipedia. In those days, people built their own sort of virtual libraries. Um, this was actually run by students. We got a little bit of funding internally, and we employed some students over the summer, over two summers. And they just kept the thing up to date. And there's about 3,000 links, drew in an awful lot of people into the university, because the marine side of it, we were the only people doing that. And of course, all those 3,000 sites then linked back to us, which was really, really good. What's not on there? is that I've also started using this for um, um, teaching and learning. Um, when I started teaching, uh, those are the days when you had the overhead projectors. If you were going to do anything, you had to have acetates and write things. And my handwriting is shocking. I can't read my own handwriting. So I, I started off you know, in very early days of using the first versions of PowerPoint and knocking up slides, and then print them out. Laser printer, print them out, job done. Which meant I thought, great, I'm actually producing stuff that students could read. And the students were coming up at the end of the lectures going, can we not just not have the slides? You've already done it, can, can we not just have them? And I thought, well, yeah, why not? We then had to develop a process for it, because the slides were quite big. And <coughs> you couldn't email those big attachments. So <coughs> I put them on the website, and <coughs> students wanted to take their own copies of them. They didn't have their own computers in those days, but they wanted to get them off the website and move them around so they can go and do things with them. So we then had to um, actually create self-extracting zip files <coughs> that would fit onto a floppy disk. And uh, <coughs> drove some of the IT support people absolutely mad because we did it without telling anybody. And I got a lot of grief saying, well, what's going to happen is that your students just aren't going to turn up to your lectures because you've given them all the stuff. What's the incentive? I thought, actually, the incentive is I don't have to do that crap PowerPoint presentation anymore. Yeah, they've got all that. What I can do is say, look at it, come back to me, which bits do we need to go in in more detail? It worked a dream. Students absolutely loved it. I also found out that students were downloading them at really odd times. I had one guy, everything was bit downloaded at 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, why are you doing this at 3 o'clock in the morning? And I said, he said, well, <coughs> I've got a job. I work on the door in a bar in Union Street. I don't get home till 2 o'clock, I past 2 in the morning. By the time I've washed the blood off me, all right, I'm ready to go and do something. All right? And he said, you're saving me life here. I've got everything that I need to do. And you know, I can really concentrate on what you're saying because I've been up half the night. That's a really, really important lesson. And you know, thinking about it, this is about, again, one of those examples that suddenly technology just opens up practice. We're able to bring in information from the outside world, involve industry, involve other people, and actually support students in the choice of actually how they manage their learning. And that, that was a really, really interesting piece of work and something that we, we, you know, I want to keep going. So um, things sort of you know, bounced along for a few years, um, running around using you know, the web for teaching and learning, mainly within the own department, actually talking to people like John Chudley about how can we exploit this, how can we do things, how can we get some money to take it further forward. And um, it was at that point that I was introduced to, uh, to a colleague where is he? Mark Stone. I like this photo because it reminds us of two things. One of them, it reminds me of the colour my hair should be. Uh, another one, it reminds you of what hair looks like. Yeah? <laughs> Have you still got that sofa? No, no. I bet you still got the slippers. Right? We were very, very, very young academics. Yeah, and we didn't know each other. We were, uh, I was working for the Institute of Marine Studies on campus. Mark was working in, a, in, a, in a, another part of the university, which no longer exists, which was the Department of Land Use and Rural Management in Newton Abbott. 
Um, but Mark was going down a similar journey to the one I was going down. He'd been to a conference, found out about the web, web stuff, set a website up and was doing bits and pieces and was also looking ways of <coughs> actually you know, exploiting this and seeing you know, how we can actually get some money to take it further forward. And um, <coughs> the university managed to get hold of some money. Uh, does anybody here remember CV, the Continuing Vocational Education Fund? Run by a wonderful woman called Joan Taylor, uh, who looked after myself and Mark for a number of years. Um, and they had £300,000 up for grabs. And we didn't know each other, and it turns out that we'd both sort of put a plan together to <coughs> raid this fund of money. Yeah? Because neither of us was greedy, so <coughs> we'd both put in bids <laughs> for 160000 quid. Yeah? Uh -huh. Very similar bids, all about this is the internet, this is the web, we can do this. Uh, all these new markets for teaching and learning and CPD and short course provision and we could even make money for the university at some point and all this sort of stuff. And uh, can you guess what happened to those bids? <laughs> yeah, they got rejected. And of course being 1990s that we had those sort of uh, acid house and unhappy faces on us. Um, but what we were told to do all right, was actually to get together and, uh, and join forces. And that's the first time I met Mark Stone. Uh, was we, we were told, yeah, you've got very similar bids. Go and see what you can do. I think we, we, we met in a pub in um, um, Muttley Plain somewhere for the first time, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just came up with some, some ideas. And <clears throat> we both thought, yeah, well, we believe in this stuff, but they're not going to give us £160,000 yet. Um, <clears throat> so what we did is we, we picked out the best bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We added it together, right? And we put in a small bid, a joint bid, 20,000 pound, right? The important thing in there is phase one. And that was funded. And we're very, very happy about that. Now, this is all part of a master plan. Was, <coughs> oh, sorry, I should say, the lesson learned on that, and it's very important, one that we still keep going today, is yeah, start small, think big. That synergy really, really works. Um, you can't work in sort of e-learning, technology enhanced learning without the rest of the community and your colleagues. And co working collaboratively is the only way of doing it. I've seen this happen with people try and do it independently and it just fails time and time again. So I'll just park that little nugget and <coughs> come back to the, uh, the story of once upon a time. So we had our phase one funded. We put in phase two and that was funded. We then started looking around and there was teaching and learning fund and we put, my put a bid in, Mark put a bid in there and we had students sent an independent learning bid. We actually got nearly all of the £160,000 project funded through a variety of, of means. Um, and <clears throat> then became sort of the, the, the moment of inspiration was that we, thought, we got all this stuff, what do we do with it? And I think this came out from another meeting in a pub, didn't it? Of, what do we do now? Well, <clears throat> some of you may remember Hill, the Plymouth Internet Learning Lab. Well, you know, we got lots of really good stuff, really good ideas. What would happen if we just put it into one big website and joined it all together? What would we have? All right. Well, this is what we had. Dave Gad around at all. Talking to a man with no hair. Is, is, is Dave. <coughs> so Dave came on board as well. Dave was part of the, the genius behind it. It was one of those people that could sort of extract the information of what we wanted and, and make it happen and start of a very, very long relationship. In fact, we, we stole Dave from, from, from the library, which, um, from, from Jane, and <laughs> Dave used to run network statistics. And, oh, really boy, boring, right? Come and do cutting edge stuff. And uh, it's quite interesting when you look back on, on what we've done. The first thing is that this is actually taken out of the Internet Archive, so you can see it at archive.org. Um, outcome of a, a project, which was the CVE project. Um, but we ended up with this thing called Learning Lab, learning space. People can access and interact with, with, with content. Um, notice boards. We're pushing information to students. We had library. We actually had worked with librarians. We'd looked at, in those days, how we could actually link into the electronically into the interlibrary loan request system. So we're still you know, doing stuff with, with, with physical systems. We had online assessment. We actually had registration in there. And registration comes tracking and actually building up you know, pictures of learning. Uh, and we had a social element in there as well. We are calling it a common room. Really interesting when you start mapping that against what's actually in there in the, the what's now known as the virtual learning environments. I just want to put the PIL stuff into context. Um, PIL's here, 1996. 
<coughs> the OU first did their virtual summer school only two years before that. You had the work going on in Wolverhampton with Steve Molyneux in Wolf the year before. <coughs> the big players didn't really come in until afterwards. I was, the state is wrong, I was been talking to Mark Stiles. That was when Cozy was launched, released. released. <coughs> but you, 996. So the same sort, same sort of time as Pill. And then you had Desire to Learn and some of the big guys coming in, uh, Doogie Mass bringing in Moodle and things like that. So I really wish we'd known what we were doing then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I have having a conversation with Mark earlier on and we were just saying that you know, w w there was a few of us in exactly the same situation that we were working independently in universities doing all this stuff. But you know, we weren't unlike a lot of these guys that were driven by profit. We're actually driven by how can we improve teaching and learning. And uh, yeah, it's one of those really interesting things. So we were bouncing along with Pill. We were using it. We were still using it as sort of collateral for other, other projects as well. And uh, one of the, the instigators behind this was, was Dave Gadd. If you remember working on Adapt QCOL, this was an interesting project, big European project. Of uh, unfortunately, we let Mark Stone go to the meetings, and, and Mark would come back by going, "Yeah, I've agreed that we'll make sure that there'll be another thousand beneficiaries in the project." <laughs> going, oh God, no! <laughs> and we ended up working with about a thousand local SMEs and micro companies, looking at internet training, looking at how we could support the early days of e-commerce, and that gave us an awful lot of experience. And and then one day we got audited by the European Commission, or well, the project was audited. And they, they introduced a new word to us, or two new words. They asked us what our sustainability strategy was. And the normal response is, well, I'll apply for more money. Yeah? <laughs> and <coughs> they said, no. They said, what you've got is some really good stuff here. And you believe in what you're doing, all right? The feedback you're getting from all these companies is really, really good. How are you going to take it on further? And <coughs> again, I think it was probably a meeting in a pub. And, and Dave saying, I can do a website for 30 quid, <coughs> is a way of getting lots of companies actually to look at e-commerce. Because we're looking at the, 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 you know, the, the package there, the actual training, how we can get these people into the university as well. And, and we thought, being good socialists, that we would uh, um, come up with a, a cooperative idea. And we set up this little thing called the Internet Co-op. We went to the university and said, we think you know, there is some, some commercial gain here. We can transfer the, the sort of academic experience that we've got and, and see how we can actually do that commercially. And they said, yeah, 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 yeah do that. You've got to trade with the university for a while before you can, you can spin out. And we were, we were going really, really well. We were doing lots of activities in our, our, in our sort of trading unit mode, and we were about to spin out. And we had Learning Lab, which was sort of the academic side of it. And we thought, well, we need to have a more of a commercial, commercial arm for this. So we registered a domain name and built a website, which was learninglab.co.uk. And um, we were just about to spin out. And I, I've, I've redacted lots of information on this email. <coughs> An email turned up telling us that um, we could not use the domain name learninglab.co.uk because <coughs> this person, who remained nameless, um, <coughs> was writing to us on behalf of uh, a, a number of people that he was partnered with looking at uh, e-learning. And these partners included some, some minor players in technology, <laughs> Microsoft, ICL, BT, Cisco, Granada, BBC, Cable and Wireless. I, I think there's more actually in that list, but I, I lost the will to live. Uh, but, you, but you get the picture. And we were told, OK, uh, we went to see the university. And they, we said, look, we've got a problem here. And they said, the university said, no, 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 just go and do it. And, What's the worst that can happen is that they sue you. You haven't got any assets. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? You'll get lots of publicity for it. And that was really, and we just went ahead and did it. And, uh, and that's how we, we set up uh, IK3. And IK3 is now run successfully by, by Dave and Nick at the back there. How many graduates have we got there? 20? 23. 23 graduates. Yeah, in the science park. <coughs> working with commercial sectors, other universities. But you know, it's nice to think that some of the stuff that myself and Mark and Dave did in the early days feed, in, feed into that success. But sort of there is a, there is a lesson there that, <clears throat> again, this is going back sort of 15 years, that when these commercial boys start getting involved, that you know, this e-learning thing might take off. There might be something there. And uh, yeah, perhaps that we should have gone, yeah, we can make loads of money out of it. Or perhaps we can actually sit there and have a good time doing what we enjoy doing. So again, I'll just park this one there for a moment. Um, so 
we had more and more projects with technology. And <clears throat> I really want to talk about the most important side of things, which is about, about people. And, um, you know, technology is great. We're doing lots of teaching and learning stuff. And as time went on, um, we started doing more and more work with students, more and more work on sort of the, the national stage. And uh, I'd like to introduce two other players into the conversation, which is Rob Stilwell and Anne McDermott, wherever you guys are. <laughs> Zan, there's Rob. Sat next to him. Um, <clears throat> they've been working as sort of my research colleagues for, for, for a number of years on a, on a whole range of projects. And we were, um, you know, interested in the data that's been coming out nationally on how our students are um, all using technology and, uh, you know, they're all really good at it and it's great and, uh, you know, everything in the garden is lovely. That worried me slightly. In think, 2006, there was a big national study came out looking at student expectations, saying that, yes, yeah, 70% of students regularly use social networking. Okay, this is a few years ago. Was, at the time, we were running a project called uh, Uspace, which was working with uh, our, our partner college students, about, about 200, 300 students in partner colleges. So we actually asked the students, well, a whole range of questions, and one of them was about the use of social networking. And as you can see, that actually... It's less than 20% of our students. And <clears throat> that was worrying me, especially when it comes to the sort of policy making and decision making over, <clears throat> you know, is the data that's being produced by our sector, all right, can you actually generalise with it? Does it apply to all our, all our students? Um, and, you know, we learned quite an interesting lesson there about not making assumptions. And <clears throat> as some of you know, because um, I badged you to death over it, that, um, you know, we're very keen on making sure that we, we have uh, data about you know, our students, now whether that's sort of locally to the university, local to the region, or local to the, the sector, sort of the post-92 sector, it's really, really important we actually get, get that information. And <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some of that for the next few minutes, um, about this data, but I'm just going to go off on a tangent a little bit. Um, we're now in a sort of, in a climate where there is no money, and this is really, really important. I mean... <clears throat> Myself and Mark, we've known each other for work together for about, number, about 10 years now, through some really good times where, you know, you've got an idea, you go to one of the funding councils, one of the funders, and they go, yeah, that's a really good idea, have a big check, get on with it and do it, all right? It doesn't exist anymore. There is no money. Uh, apart from the Higher Education Academy, just give me 10,000 quid, but there is a little bit of money, but there's not, there's not much out there. And <clears throat> that's a real problem, all right, because there's still a lot of work to do, and we need to be able to, you know, to get on and do it. So if no one's going to give us huge pots of money, we've got to find other ways of working. Yeah, you know, we can't just say, I'm not going to do anything, no one's going to pay me. All right, how are we going to get this done? So, there's a story of uh, two of my favourite things in life, which is uh, social media and red wine. Um, so, being a techie person, I don't have any friends, so on a Friday night, I end up drinking red wine and going online. Uh, and uh, as do a number of my, uh, my colleagues across the sector, uh, including Professor Stiles here as well, I think you were, you were involved on that. And this was a, a few years ago that yet another national study had come out. And I won't mention the, the university, but it was a, a university from very far north of the United Kingdom with lots of very rich students. And <laughs> it was basically, and they, they were crowing about, oh, sorry, they were crowing. They were um, communicating the fact that, uh, that uh, all their students had, uh, had iPhones, that they were all uh, totally au fait with technology. They were all running blog sites, and weren't they absolutely brilliant? And I suppose we were getting a little bit caustic on a Friday night and uh, <coughs> saying, well, I don't believe this. And I know Mark was there, and there was a few other people popped up as well. Uh, Mark Stubbs from Manchester met, Becca Colley from, uh, from Bradford, and the guys from Northampton came in at the end. And we were sort of going, OK, well, we need to do something about this. Um, <coughs> and we thought, well, why don't we just do it? <coughs> Let's put together, all right, survey questions, focus group stuff, and run it across multiple institutions and agree just to share the data. And if we all put a little bit of resource into it, all right, so, you know, we all collect the data. And I said, I'll do the analysis and collate it and then get it out, all right. And we said, yeah, we'll go ahead and do that without a consortium agreement, <clears throat> without any paperwork, without any contracts. It would have taken lots of time, effort and money to do that. And basically, there is a consortium agreement of 140 characters going, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> we developed a survey and a survey tool, and that's been developed over the years now, um, and I think is in use in about 14 or 15 other universities. We're about to go international with it, as Dave Cormier in Prince Edward Island University is going to be using it as well. Um, but the most important stuff is not only do we actually share the question set, we share the data. 
So Plymouth runs a biennial student technology survey, which I'll mention in a while. Um, the reason why it's biennial is because in the, the sort of the alternating years, Manchester Met run it, and their student date is actually quite similar to ours. And we share it. And I'll share that data with anybody in the sector because it actually could benefit institutions. So <coughs> that's, for me, a really, really interesting you know, way of working. And we need to get this sort of information together. Um, <coughs> have you all seen... This wonderful meme, yeah? I was talking to Jane about it. Is it 20 odd years? Yeah? Does he have a name? <coughs> so, if you've not seen it, this is a superb piece of sculpture that's up in the library, all right, and it's of a guy wandering through, through the walls there holding a book. And my premise is that maybe we actually need to think about updating this. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? <coughs> and... <coughs> You know, is this the vision of the future? Yeah? <clears throat> well, in order for us to find that out, we actually have to go and talk to people. We have to go and ask our students. And some work we've been doing over the last couple of years is working with students and staff in our university and other universities. Not so much asking them just about what do you use in terms of technology, but it's about, you know, a whole range of things, about hopes, fears, aspirations when it comes to technology, to see, you know, where is an institution, what is it that we need to do to be able to support our students and staff in the future. And I've just got some very small bits of data here, um, but just, just to really illustrate a few points. Our students have lots of technology, yeah? So here's a quick one, smartphone ownership, lots of students have a smartphone, brilliant. About 90 odd percent have got a laptop as well, and we've got data on a whole load of kit that they, the students own. When it comes to tablets, yeah, this is a, a relatively new area, but we, I mean, I did this survey a couple of years ago and tablet ownership was pretty low, now it's increasing. And uh, I, I must say thanks to Steph in the Students' Union for uh, pointing out that I should actually be running this survey after Christmas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, look what I got. Oh. All right. uh, it's not all good news, though. This isn't a thing about just collecting data, it's actually talking to people. Um, <clears throat> although 20% of students with, a, with an iPad, iPad mini, doesn't mean they're actually happy with that. Um, one of the big issues and something we need to be aware of is that if we're going to give some students an iPad or an iPad mini, that really annoys other students, yeah? Because they're all paying £9,000 a year. So we need to be really careful in why we're actually giving technology away, all right? Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant, but should we not be doing it for all our students? Yeah, I know some institutions have, but that needs to be managed. Students talk to each other. Where did you get that from? Oh, I don't know. I found it. No, I was given it by... <laughs> All right. So just a little thing to take away there. Um, <clears throat> my advice at the moment is buy shares in Apple because our students are going to... what They want to buy Apple products. There's a bit missing off here. This is actually Android phone and Android tablet that's here. So Apple, very, very much aspirational. Our students are planning to buy more technology. It's nothing that's... You know, it's not a one-off. So... <sighs> We know our students own lots of technology. It's quite interesting asking them about oh, how confident do you feel about using that technology? And students are confident, it's great. So basically, oh, extremely confident, very confident, all right? But there's more confidence in their, um, their personal life and technology than it is for, for studying. But there's not many saying I'm not that confident. They're all pretty switched on with it. An interest of mine, and Paulie mentioned it this morning, is about digital literacies, digital skills. So we've asked the students a whole range of questions about digital literacy. And again, they're all very, very confident, especially this one about communication and collaboration. Yeah, yeah, no problems at all. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, very, very confident here. Very confident within sort of media literacy. So it's, there's a bit of work to be done here. Um, but communication, collaboration, yeah, yeah, absolutely good. Information, communication stuff, yep, no problems at all with that. So it's great. Students are really confident in their use of technology. I don't have a job anymore. Yeah? Job done. Well, not quite. <clears throat> it's really, really interesting when we start asking students, okay, well, what are you using? You know, so there's a whole range of services here, virtual worlds and video calling and bookmarking and things. And then comparing what's being used for study and what's being used for their social life. And you can see there, there, is, a, there is a marked difference here. So we've got all this technology, they're really, really confident in using it, and they've got really, really good digital skills. So why aren't we seeing this stuff being used as part of teaching and learning? 
Well, part of it's a confidence issue, and part of it is the fact that we don't actually have staff promoting the use of this technology in teaching and learning. But I'll come on to that, on, on to that in a moment. We see exactly the same sort of <coughs> disparity in um, services. So these are sorts of you know common sort of <coughs> Web two type services, social media type stuff. Um, but yeah, it's personal life, fair bit of use, studying, not so much. It's really, really interesting, though, that <coughs> this surprised me, that we've still got a lot of MySpace and uh, Bebo users here. Still got some of the MySpace and Bebo generation. So I'll be really interested to see when we get the data from Manchester Met in a year's time to see what the changes are there and also where we're going to be in the next couple of years. And, of course, Facebook, though, completely dominates. So that led me thinking, well, is this use of Facebook, is that what everybody's thinking that communication and collaboration is about. I've got a laptop, I've got a tablet, and I can use Facebook, therefore I have no problems with the use of technology. And <clears throat> that does worry me. Because I would expect, with all that confidence in technology and systems and digital skills, that we would see large numbers of people using things like cloud storage. That really worries me that actually our students aren't using it. We ran a, myself and Rob and Anne ran a session with some students um, a few months ago um, <coughs> about uh, usage of tablets and iPads. And uh, we found one student that had written her entire dissertation on iPad. That takes some doing. I hate typing on an iPad. Entire dissertation on iPad, really, really good. And I, so we said, yeah, how do you back it up? What, you know, do you use Dropbox? Right. Nothing whatsoever. Yeah? That's not an isolated case. So we've got to make that link from going, OK, just because you've got the kit and you can use Facebook, all right, there are other things that we actually need to, uh, you know, to encourage you to use. We need to be careful. All right? There's an assumption that all our students are using Twitter. And I know some of you have heard me rant on about this. If I ever see a 10 top tips for teaching with Twitter guide, I said it without swearing then, which is really good, um, I will hang someone. Um, our students, that, that, you know, again, it may be a generational thing. And... This actually is an important issue about the generational side of things because we've got our MySpace users, we've got our Bebo users, some students are using Twitter. And as an institutionally, it's very difficult to actually plan because we, we're getting a snapshot in time. Yeah? We know what our students are using now, all right? and we're quite lucky because our sort of 18 to 25-year-olds in their formative years over the last you know, four or five years of technology use hasn't actually been much change. So there is this move between different platforms and different services. Right? As time goes on, there's going to be more and more services, more and more platforms, different things being used for different things. How are we as an institution actually going to be able to keep up with that and how are we going to be able to support and advise our students? Well, we need to actually ask them, find out more about what they actually want to use. So <clears throat> the sort of impact of technology that's actually having on our students, um, <clears throat> pretty much guarantee you. Students actually, you know, they're really good, they're willing to use and expect their devices to actually support teaching and learning. Um, they're assuming, though, that our staff can actually support them in the use of technology. And that's quite a tricky issue that we have to deal with. We have a mismatch between confidence and competence, and that applies to staff as well. Not only staff thinking, yeah, yeah, students, they're all IT literate, absolutely brilliant, no worries at all, all right? And staff thinking, yeah, I've got a tablet, therefore I can do anything. So we do actually need to get the message home that we need to do some work there. And that owning a device using Facebook and Twitter does not necessarily mean those digital skills are high. And the reason I'm banging on about this is because in terms of employability, there's an expectation that students will actually have those skills. And we have to over overcome this issue about this mismatch between confidence and competence. And <coughs> I'm not going to have time to go through. I I'm realise I'm... You're fine. It's yeah. an unorthodox lecture. You can take all night. <laughs> Had I known that, so I will, I, will, I will get the other 50 slides I've yet to use. Um, <coughs> some quite interesting examples about you know, what's actually out there and how people use information. There's a, there's a, there was a case actually a couple of weeks ago of a, uh, of, a, of a William Blake poem, which turns out not to be written by William Blake. But because it was on Wikipedia that it was, <coughs> and that information has then gone into school textbooks and exam syllabi, <coughs> it's got to be true. And uh, my, uh, some of my sort of social media colleagues who are librarians were really, really happy when a librarian found that it was fake. But it wasn't fake, it was just a... And um, we've got to be really careful about the stuff that, that you know, is available online, people actually believing it. That's part of digital literacy, of going, you know, just because it's online doesn't mean it's true. 
The big worry we have at the moment, though, is about students and staff, right, and their digital footprint. And there's been some quite <coughs> interesting cases recently, which I, I won't have time to go to. <coughs> uh, the horrific one that, frankly, has been taken off Facebook now, Facebook pages about rate your shag, yeah? <coughs> Giving people scores on their, their sexual ex exploits. Pages was taken down immediately. Well, actually not immediately, uh, probably about 10 days after because the Daily Mail got involved, um, but they were taken down, all right? Students have posted on that page. Okay, they may think it's gone. It hasn't, all right? <coughs> Facebook keep shadow profiles. Everything that's in there and all your interactions are recorded by Facebook, yeah? <coughs> Don't post things like that. It will catch you out as was found out by um, the woman who knocked off a cyclist, who knocked over a cyclist, and then tweeted about it that she just knocked off some bloody cyclist. <laughs> um, and she was found out, and I believe she's lost her job. And there was a young woman who, of course, made the, uh, the, the Youth Police and Crime Commissioner, um, and she had made some unsavoury tweets in a, um, a few years ago when she was a lot, long, a, a lot younger. They were uncovered by one of our daily newspapers, and uh, um, <coughs> led to her resignation. So digital footprint has a major, major impact. And again, it's one of those things that you know, we need to be able to communicate with. And I realize that this part of the presentation is called Shiny Happy People. <laughs> and <coughs> yeah, one of the problems that we have is, um, is people like um, Michael Gove coming up <coughs> with phrases such as digital natives, and this assumption that our children are digital natives and they speak fluent technology, yeah? They don't. And that's a really, really dangerous phrase, digital natives. Uh, I think it's naive and dangerous. Um, as is Michael Gove. Um, but that's a, that's a, <laughs> another story there completely. So, you know, for me, it's about working with staff and students, making sure that we, we get the message out there that there's a whole load of skills that, you know, you, you probably want to have a look at. Um, and, you know, there's no expectation that we will have a whole load of digital natives. I mean, I work with technology. I work with guys who are more switched on to technology than I'll ever be. Um, but none of us, you know, I wouldn't say none of us are native to it at all. Yeah. We've, we've got skills in being able to make decisions and ask the right questions. And I think, it, you know, to, to think that the technology will just sort it all out is completely the wrong approach. So... <coughs> Which leads me nicely on to technology. Anybody thought I've thought this through, actually? It's, uh, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about technology because you get, you get bored of me showing you shiny things. But I, 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 Paulie mentioned that I'm uh, doing work with um, uh, the New Media Consortium, which is a, uh, a group of people worldwide who basically spend two months at the end of the year uh, on a wiki arguing with each other <laughs> over what's on the horizon, what's going to be the big impact in a number of sectors, including education. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, and I've been involved in them for the last couple of years, and there's about 60 of us, and it gets quite fraught online. Um, but every year, this, this report is produced in about sort of February, March time, and the 2013 report obviously came out this year. And I just want to bounce through some of the, some of the highlights for it. Um, some of you may have come across this, the MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course. You cannot open the Times Higher Education Supplement or actually Education Guardian now without there being an article on MOOC. But they alter alternate. So one week, MOOC is bad. Next week, MOOC is good. MOOC bad, MOOC good. MOOC bad, MOOC good. All right, go through Times Higher, their website, you'll see it. All right. um, lots and lots of excitement in the sector about massive online open courses. And I'm not going to go into any great detail about them, but you know, they're here, they've got traction. Lots of issues are very, very popular at the moment. Um, and, and was predicted by the Horizon Report of being one of the, the big things to come in in 2013. Tablet computing. Well, we're seeing that students are buying technology, staff are accessing technology. Tablet computing is having an impact in education. What's coming? Things like gaming, uh, <coughs> games and gamification. Um, so that's actually, um, you know, this isn't about playing. This is taking non-games environments and creating simulation and games around them. Um, very engaging way of actually working, lots of interest in this area. Um, I believe Janice Gibbs was talking about this in her session earlier on. So if anybody else wants more information, talk to Janice. Um, 
thing that interests me at the moment is about learning analytics. Um, that's definitely on the horizon. Quite a complex subject. Everything we do collects data. Um, so we're looking at students and access to information and learning activities and assessments and assignments and social interactions and activity on blogs. We can actually put that all together and <coughs> start tailoring um, personal feedback based on activity. Um, we can in, you know, if you look at what educational opportunities need to be created based on someone's previous performance. Obviously used in the right way, really, really useful. Used in the wrong way, really, really scary and a very powerful tool. So learning analytics, another one of those areas that's coming along. And in the more longer term, things like 3D printing, uh, cost for 3D printer, down to about $1,500 now. Um, <coughs> is having an impact in education. Um, we're already seeing it in the research area, 3D models, um, sort of chemical and organic designs, stuff like that. That's all coming in. And <coughs> the final piece of technology I just bounced through is the Google Glass. Um, I think one of my colleagues, Graham, sent me an article about Google Glass yesterday in which there was a, an academic that was getting very, very excited because Google was sending him his pair of Google Glasses. And he was asked, well, what can you do with them that, you know, in, in an education context? And he was going, oh, if I could get image recognition software on there, I can look at a student and their name would pop up in front of me. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> right. <clears throat> My point isn't about all, the, all, the, all these technologies. That The point is about the technology changes really, really quickly. I mean, the horizon is a well-respected approach, and it uh, doesn't always get it right, but it does actually get the, the sort of uh, the zeitgeist. It, you know, it pulls the themes together. It says, yeah, this is actually what's going to be happening now and in the future, and it's pretty robust. Um, <clears throat> the difference between 2012 and 2013 is the wonderful world of the MOOC, the massive online open course. They came from nowhere in sort of mid-2012. You cannot open any... <coughs> education journal now really without seeing MOOC go to any education conference there's always someone talking about MOOCs yeah they have appeared they have traction they're very very shiny all right and they're not going to go away and I think you know what I'm trying to say is that the lesson here is that these trends change very very fast Google Glass it says you know four to five years they'll be here next year yeah no doubt one of my team will actually put in an order form for a for a pair quite soon and I should go, no, you can't do that. Write me a business case and buy two pairs because uh, I want some. <laughs> and, uh, and so. But that technology changing really fast is really, really important lesson. So <clears throat> I did say we're going to go and look at the Akron at Atoll. And we mentioned some of these projects and our, our ability to create words out of project titles. One of the problems of acronyms in title, project titles is you end up forgetting what they actually stand for. Um, I have no idea what pineapple stands for. Uh, I ran that project with, with Anne and Rob for, for two years, and it's got APL, Accreditation of Prior Experiential Learning, something in there. It has a life of its own. Um, I put them up there because all these projects, I've worked with some really, really amazing people. Um, I mean, Pill, start with, with Dave and, and Mark. Um, <coughs> Warp with, with, with Anne McDermott, which is Web Accessibility Research Projects. Um, Shellfish, there's a whole load of people that are involved. Is Glenn Crust in here today? Did he make it? Glenn and uh, uh, Dave Crute and Arlene Franklin Stokes are involved in those projects. Um, of course, I was part of the Help Kettle, which was run by Mark Stone, and there's vast amounts of people involved that are still around the university with the Help Kettle, superb five year project, and things like that. <coughs> the reason we actually mention these projects is that if you start looking like under the bonnet, you, you, they're not about technology. They may appear to be about technology, pill, learning environment. Warp was about web accessibility and standards. Shellfish, online assessment and feedback. The Help Kettle, higher education and further education, knowledge management, repositories, and, and so on. Um, and you know, people think it's about technology. You're building stuff, therefore technology is there, therefore all I have to do is go and use new place and my life will be you know, sorted. And you know, that's not true. Um, for me, it, it's really about you know, technology being the sort of the glue, the enabler, about a really, really important relationship between students, staff, and institution. I know those arrows go around that way, but they cross link, and if I tried that, it looked really, really messy. Um, but that, that user side of it is absolutely vital. And you know, that's something that has been a, you know, a lesson that we've learned over the last few years about you know, technology where appropriate, based on user needs. And it sounds something that's really, really simple, but we keep on forgetting it. 
We just go and buy something because it's really shiny. Yeah. Um, number of universities, including this one. Heads of school gave out loads of iPads. No thought about what they're going to be used for. Here, take it. Go and improve the student experience with a free toy. It doesn't work. Yeah. What are your needs? Make sure you've got the right technology. So I'll park that one as well. It's so, all right. We're getting towards the end. And um, I just want to go to one final area, and, uh, which is called Land of Control Freaks. And um, for this point, <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, an esteemed colleague, which is with Mark Stiles, and, uh, who's greatly informed this area. And Mark's not only introduced me to a number of things such as caught up in the jacket lining here. Bear with me a moment. Technology fail. So not only did Mark introduce me to, you know, the whole area of, of uh, innovation and attention and control, he also introduced me to the wonderful world of electronic cigarettes, which has <laughs> saved my life. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for this. Uh, <laughs> by An electronic cigarette. Oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. Sorry. Um, I really would recommend Mark, Mark's paper because it's something that, that it's certainly I've taken on board over the last few years. And there's, it's getting really powerful um, sort of traction in the sector at the moment. And <clears throat> Plymouth is really lucky because most of the recommendations that Mark is making up, we're actually implementing anyway. Yeah? It's about having the right governance. It's about having the right decision making. It's about people taking responsibility. But we're still in a, in a time where there are a number of tensions. Um, sort of innovation in which we get involved in is high risk. You, know, you take risks with, it, with, with, you know, with innovation. Um, institutions want to control. When I say control, that's not a bad thing. You know, it's about making sure that the risk is lowered. And <coughs> that, that does cause us you know, some concerns, and it does cause us arguments. But having, I suppose having arguments is great, because that's what university is actually about. And <coughs> Some of the models that we've run previously across the sector were great if there was a, a single university system. If every student and member of staff came in and used a university computer and then went home again, yet yeah, you could control it. All right. You can't do that anymore. User needs are changing, their expectations are changing, so we need to find new ways of actually working that meet those user needs. And we make it more complex as well. As not only do we have the sort of tension between innovation and control. There's a tension with pedagogy as well. <clears throat> you know, we're in the digital age, there's new technology. We need to think how we can actually use technology in the best way to support teaching and learning. It's not a question of just throwing people an iPad at someone and saying, yeah, get on with it. Yeah? Those schools uh, that have given every pupil an iPad, <clears throat> yeah, a number of them are saying, actually, we got it wrong. Yeah? <clears throat> Yeah, we get lots of publicity for it. Yeah, it's very great. Everybody feels that you know, it's there, but we don't know how to support it. We don't really know, you know, is this thing actually enhancing the learning experience or is it just a, a glossy thing that uh, we, we can show people? So you know, we may have to change our practice. So as academics, we may have to change our practice in an environment where there's a tension between what we want to innovate with uh, against the requirements of the centre. And <coughs> unfortunately, Helen couldn't be here today. I had a very nice email from her today. Um, but Helen is a, an old friend of the university, as is her colleague Rona Sharp, who's now at uh, Oxford Brookes University. Um, I would highly recommend Helen and Rona's book. Second edition actually has a great the final chapter all about uh, the, the, the pedagogic changes that we can make to really support our students with the use of technology. Because things are changing. Um, <coughs> you know, students have technology. I don't think that this may not be a vision of the future. Every student with an iPad, but hey, it might happen. Um, but we're also seeing our students looking at, you know, using their own systems. They're using their own software to develop their own learning environment. We see it with staff creating their own teaching environment. So this is not university systems. So staff and students, some are doing this at the moment, some may do this in the future, opt out of what we provide institutionally, choosing their own way of working. And, <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, that we, you know, we need to be able to work in an environment or have an environment that supports our users in their own choice of technology and actually how they use that technology. And this is really sort of the last lesson that <clears throat> I'm coming up with, is that institutionally we need to be able to flex to meet those user expectations. And in some ways that can be a, a difficult thing to do and a different way of actually thinking. So, as you've seen, 
throughout the last hour, oh dear, gone over my 54 minutes, um, <coughs> I've collected some of these recommendations. And uh, you know, we're, at the end of, we're at the end of the voyage now. And the technology's let me down, so it hasn't scrolled through the next slide. There it goes, there it goes. We're getting there. It's obviously an iPad wants a drink now. So it's, <coughs> um, and being a good reflective practitioner, okay, it's fine going, so what, what do we do? What, what does it actually mean? Well, so I started looking at these sort of things I picked up. I said, well, what, what, does, what does that actually mean? Well, it's not about the technology. Well, that's about context. What is it you're trying to do? If we know what we're trying to do, we can develop solutions around it. <coughs> that issue about opening a wider audience, that's about the user focus. Who is it you're trying to communicate with? Who is it you're trying to work with? In terms of synergy, well, <coughs> That's about collaboration. We're in a, you know, the sector has changed. There is no money. The only way we're actually going to get any of these answers is to actually work together. Uh, the e-learning thing that, that uh, <coughs> yeah, a little bit trite. But again, that's about context, yeah. <coughs> it did. E-learning got very big. We could have been millionaires, mate, but we, <laughs> we choose the academic life instead. Data about our students, very much focus about evidence. And some, as you know, yeah, I like collecting evidence because it actually shows that we're right, which is the important thing. <laughs> we have to be able to adapt. You know, we're in a very, very fast moving area at the moment. I have no idea what the next bit of technology is going to be. Um, everybody said that the iPad is going to be a game changer. iPads are boring now. Yeah, fourth generation, they really come on. Something else is going to come on. Um, we have to wait and see what happens and whether we can use it. And <coughs> I suppose the last two are really, really focused. Again, you're going to get bored of me about saying about the user focus, but it is making sure what we do is focused in around our students and around our staff around, of, of the institution. And we pull that together, all right? I suppose the new tell world is not focused around technology. I always said I'm a, I used to be the head of technology enhanced learning, but I don't really care about the technology. And I don't. It's about making sure what we have, have is totally appropriate for what is it we're trying to achieve. And <clears throat> so the tell world, it's not about a technology. It's about a change in attitude and having the right attitude. It's about having that user focus. It's about having the evidence and <clears throat> yeah, the collaboration, the sharing, the adaption, making sure that we can respond to our environment, making sure we can respond to the user needs. And then we actually get the enhancement. So... <clears throat> Yeah, I reckon that's going to happen. Yeah. Students have devices, their own devices. We need to be able to work with them and institutionally be able to support them in doing it. Um, and really what we're doing is we're, we're supporting that, that change in sort of control. And we're very much putting the user right at the heart of it, of saying, yeah, you, it's your decision on what you use. And we need to be able to support you in that choice of the, in, and actually making the choice. And in that, once you've made that decision, in about using those t that technology and those approaches as part of your learning. I'm going to finish the voyage now, but before I do, obviously we're on a voyage, and, and you can't have a voyage with a, without a crew. And <clears throat> as I said right at the beginning, this, this is really, really bizarre. See, whatever you put online, all right, it is not <laughs> safe. It's not <laughs> safe. Um, <clears throat> both this professorial thing and the National Teaching Fellow is like, it's great, I've got loads of recognition, but I can't do it. You know, nothing has been me, it's always been with people. And it's really nice seeing a load of people in here that I know I've worked with. And I'm sorry if you're not up here, but you know, there are so many people I like to thank. So, you know, <coughs> the guys in Technology Enhanced Learning I've, I've worked with for, for four years now, absolutely brilliant. Challenging at times, um, but, but that, that's good. Uh, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. <laughs> Um, the last year or so, working with um, uh, some new people, uh, the, the digital skills developers and the information specialists, really great working with these guys, getting a completely different um, aspect on what we're actually trying to achieve and huge skill base in there. Um, <coughs> there's a whole load of people over in the teaching and learning directorate that um, you know, have been involved as well, and, and some are here today. Um, and in the days of the, the help kettle as well. I mean, there's a huge amount of activity going there. And, you know, everybody that there is making a difference in sort of teaching and learning across the university. And that's really, really important. That's why we do it, you know. And uh, a really superb group of people to work with. And uh, if anybody saw the ASTI stand um, upstairs, uh, that's pretty good. Really enjoyed that.
buzzing up there. <coughs> just want to focus in on a few other people as well. Um, <coughs> I mentioned Dave and Mark, um, you, know, the, you know, kept working with those for years. John Chudley, I'm really pleased that John is back. And a professor now as well, in Southampton. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> um, Laurie Phipps isn't here, which is great, because I can't abuse him. Um, but La Laurie through JISC has been there. Uh, and I mean, Mark has, been, has always been part of my life for the last 10 years or so. And as a, as a mentor, I can't thank Mark enough. And he's the one who keeps on pushing me to go and do chairs and things like that. Um, <coughs> a few other people that I mentioned, uh, I think Mary Watkins and Bill Rammel, uh, they're the guys that really pushed me to actually apply for the chair. And I'm really grateful for their support. Um, people like Debbie and, and John, part of the Teaching and Learning Directorate, it's been great, and we haven't always agreed, but you don't want to agree every, with everybody every, you know, about everything. Having those arguments and discussions is really, really powerful. Uh, really pleased that Ian Tunbridge is here today as well. I mean, Ian's a guy that really pushed me into higher education and further education, and it's great to see him there. And <coughs> I don't think it'd be fair for us not to mention Colin Williams as well. <coughs> as uh, one of the things you get into situations and you think, yeah, what would Colin say? <coughs> um, and of course, it leads me on to the last pair of characters at the bottom there. Um, Brian Chalkley is very interesting. Brian gave me the job as head of technology enhanced learning. And I think it's safe to say, Brian, you didn't understand anything I was talking about. Um, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, <coughs> you know. It was, that's, that was an absolute blast, and, and thank you, Brian. And Brian is, you know, with National Teaching Fellow, I think you, you saw me through my, my first of many failed attempts, but we, we've learned from the process. Um, and, of course, with Pauline Neal as well. Pauline's been a, another superb mentor over the last few years and uh, has kicked me out the backside quite a few times on getting things done, and, and thank you for that. So it's been absolutely superb. Um, <laughs> I will have a finish, of course. There are people that I do have to thank. Um, I've put this photo up. My, my father, um, <coughs> just to show you where I get my sense of sartorial elegance from. Uh, he does actually clean up a bit better as well, uh, and my mother as well. And, and, you know, they've supported me through this sort of this roller coaster ride of, of just, you know, and doing odd things and going, yeah, it'll be fine, you know, play with the university and see what happens. Um, and um, I will mention the little fella at the top there, which is Mr. Beaky, uh, who is um, one of the best marking devices I've ever had. I used to do lots of marking of scripts, and unfortunately he used to come along and chew them, <laughs> um, trying to explain to students the, 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 the meaning behind the code of having all the little marks taken out of it. And uh, he's one of the few people I can talk to and doesn't answer back. Um, but the, 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 probably the most important person that I need to thank is, uh, is my wife, Anne McDermott, who's also been my sort of research partner for the last 12 years. And, and Anne is the person who is able to extract all the crap ideas I have running around my head. And which is, there's about 100 of them, and I actually go, yeah, that one's all right, and think about that. And it's the person who actually translates my stuff, hopefully, so other people can understand it. And without Anne, we wouldn't have had that big list of projects there. And <coughs> as... Uh, as a sort of co-manager, co-director of those projects, um, I think Anne needs the recognition for it. So thank you very much for that, Anne. That's superb. And, you know, couldn't have done it without you, and parents, and everybody else. And on that note, because I know there's wine next door and there's learning technologists in the room who are gagging for a drink, <laughs> um, I will stop. And thank you very much for listening to me for the last hour.